Um, welcome to the session on Birds of Goa. This is a book by, uh, with a text by Heinz Leiner, he's a German ornithologist, and the photographs are by Rahul Alvarez. Um, Rahul is a wildlife, a wildlife guy around here who takes uh, snake excursions, bird excursions, he brings out an online newsletter called Creepy Times. He, uh, he won the 2004 Young Naturalist Award from Sanctuary Magazine and Avian Agro Bank. And he has many other facets to him, some which I know, some perhaps which I don't know. Among things, he's also a fitness trainer, as you can see, he's very fit. <laughs> and he's also something called, what, a myofascial trigger point therapist, which is quite, yeah, I know. Quite a, I mean, I don't know what it means, but it sounds like if he pokes you somewhere, you will kind of pop over right away. So, I don't know what that means. He, uh, but anyway, today's session, you've seen it's very short, it's just a 15 minute session. He's taken all the photographs that have gone into this book, and this book has come out through a longish process. Uh, I think he'll quickly talk about the process a little, and then he'll show you some of the pictures that he's taken and tell you the stories behind those pictures. Alright, Rahul, over to you. So, um, actually, I got a, yeah, yeah. I've got a uh, small announcement to make. I've got uh, my girlfriend listening in from the US thanks to modern day technology through Viber. And I'm more nervous, uh, you know, about the impression she's going to have of me speaking in public than speaking in front of you all. Yeah, so, I'm Yeah, the first time she's hearing me speaking about it. Uh, so this is, I, I've got to start by saying that this is not, um, this is not the book launch. So uh, we, the book launch is going to happen later. The, uh, this is just a, me showing you some of the pictures that went into the book and uh, going through the challenges that I faced photographing uh, these different birds. So uh, the book came about actually uh, it was my dad's idea. It has already been published once by uh, my colleague uh, Heinz Leiner, and um, in fact, Annie. No, I don't think you did the cover for that. So um, it's been published once before, but it, it was just text, and he was planning to do a, a reprint of the book, uh, a, a new edition. Uh, there were a lot of corrections in the book, and, uh, a lot of new words to be added. So. So when he came to meet my dad, my dad told me, he said, why don't you ask him, you know, maybe you can put all your pictures into that, it'll be really interesting, you'll have text, and you'll have these photographs, it'll, it'll come out, uh, it'll be an amazing book. So I thought, uh, yeah, we could do that. So I talked to him, and Heinz was, uh, was great with this. He just said, yeah, that's totally fine with me, you put your pictures in there, no problem. So then we talked to the forest department, and uh, Richard D'Souza, he, he, uh, he liked the idea. And he said, uh, you know what, let's go all out. Let's make it a coffee table book. So that was amazing. I, uh, and, and the forest department put up the money for it. It was a lot of money. There's no way uh, our bookshop would have been able to put up that money. So, so we could go really extravagant. And it was a really, really um, exciting project for me. I had already shot a lot of birds until then. But it, it's different. When you start shooting for the book, you, you start to be focused. You, know? you have to focus. So here's the interesting thing. I actually shot half the book over a year and 40% of it, the remaining 40% over two months. And I think about, yeah, about 45% over two months and the last 5% in one day at a friend's bird bath. Yeah? So it just shows you uh, once you're focused and once you're planning, what you can get. And I got some birds that I've been chasing. I mean, I, I got these birds at a bird bar. I've been chasing them for a year, couldn't find them, and suddenly 10 of them are lining up, you know, to be photographed. So it was, it was, uh, it was really uh, amazing. So, uh, so yeah, let's start the presentation. So, now one of the things I was a bit worried about, but I'm not going to worry about it, because I'm going to let you see the book at some point or the other, and get a copy of it. It's not going to look as good as I want it to look like, 
uh, maybe you can see the screen as well, but I'm just going to talk about uh, the challenges, like I said, the challenges that I had to face with, with these photographs. So this is a very common bird. Yeah? It's the white-throated kingfisher. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. It's sitting on the wire all the time, and you're seeing uh, a different perspective. You're seeing it in flight. Yeah? So, and it's such a beautiful bird, but we take it for granted all the time. We see it on the, on the wire and you think, uh, yeah, who wants this bird? And you always get this, this horrible shot, you know, the bird sitting in the wire with this characterless sky in the background. And I got this photograph at Pilan Lake. Some of you know where Pilan Lake is. Yeah? It's, uh, there's a lot of garbage there now also, but it doesn't make it any less interesting. In fact, the garbage that sometimes makes it more interesting because a lot of birds come there only because of the garbage. Hello? Yeah. So, um, I was sitting there waiting for another bird and I see this bolt of blue diving out of the sky and I, I try to lock focus on it. it. It dives straight out and it dives straight into the water and there's a splash and the bird comes out and it's, and it's flying off and it's moving really fast. Yeah? And here's the thing, if you, if you panic, I mean most of the time I would miss this because what you're doing is you're trying to lock focus and then snap, uh, snap the shutter. Most of the time I, I miss it, but somehow on that day the bird was just the right distance. If it was any closer, I would have missed it. If it was any further, we wouldn't have seen any detail on it. So it was just the right distance, I locked focus, and I took the shot. And uh, uh, the best part about India is that there's always enough light. Not always, but generally there's enough light. I've shot sometimes, I mean I've shot in uh, Australia and the US and Europe, and the light very often is miserable. So to get a flight shot, you need enough light. My, my lens doesn't have a very wide aperture, so uh, there was enough light, the bird was at the right distance, I was lucky, yeah, it happened right in front of me, and all these things came together, and I got a, a, a photograph that I'm really happy with. So uh, what, I, what I want you to understand is that every photograph is a, I don't know if anyone said this before, but I feel very intelligent saying this, uh, Every photograph is a compromise. There's something you're not going to get in that. And you have to get the best possible compromise, which means that the bird is too... Uh, uh, sometimes the bird is in the right light, but it's too far. Sometimes it's, it's close enough, but it's in, in, the, in the wrong light. You know, the, uh, the light is against you. So you're always working with this, and sometimes you can bring it all together and get something really interesting. Yeah, yeah okay. This is a paradise fly casual. It's shot at the same lake, the Pilan Lake, and you won't believe why it comes there. So, I don't, I don't know how to explain this because, well, it's, Annie knows the story, so he's already laughing. But uh, a, a lot of, uh, some people go there, how do we say it? To crap. To crap. Yeah. <laughs> so there are people going there to crap, and Flycatcher, he wants flies. Where is he going to get flies? The flies are buzzing all around. So I had to just go there and sit and just suffer the smell. That's it. I just sat there, suffer the smell. And this fly, this flycatcher, he's really tricky. He's sitting in the bushes here all the time and he jumps out, he grabs a fly and he jumps back in. So I know where he's going to jump out to. So I keep my camera focused on that point and he jumps out and I take one shot. I miss the first one. The second one, I get him looking down at an odd angle. And the third one, I've got him with his mouth open, with a, what I think is a fly, like about to be devoured. <laughs> so again, a, a, you know, a very unassuming place, a very beautiful bird, like uh, this extraordinarily long tail, and uh, what to me is a very valuable photograph, shot right here at the land. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to, yeah. Now this is something that required a lot of planning. So that's a crested hawk eagle. I've been tracking this bird for the longest time. Uh, yeah, sure. There's a nest at Sokor. Uh, to get a raptor, you have to find, it, it's a good idea if you find the nest, because otherwise what you're going to get is, is this bird soaring up in the sky, and you're going to get that same angle of the bird with its wings outstretched, which is okay once in a while, but you don't want all your raptor shots to look the same way. So I was at the, uh, so I tried to track down this bird. I found the nest first, and I would keep going back there every day. So the second time I went back there, this was in the off season when I don't really have clients, because uh, clients get in the way. Actually, when you go out to photograph, 
they want to see as many birds as, as possible, and you just want to get that one bird. So, um, but they're paying you, so you have to listen to them. So I don't really photograph a lot when I'm with clients, I actually photograph when I'm alone. So I went there in the off season, somewhere, this, I think this was somewhere around June or something, and uh, I figured he was somewhere around. The second day I see him sitting, and I get a shot of him against the light. Now, I'm just going to say him, because I, I don't know whether it's a male or a female, but it's easier to say that. Uh, so I get a shot of, uh, it, but it's against the light, and it's sitting out there. The next day I go back, uh, I don't find it, and the time, I, uh, the fifth time that I go there, I've narrowed it down to this field in between two hills, and it seems to be some kind of a very safe area. This is a juvenile, yeah? It's, it's a young one, it's fully grown, it's as big as the adult, but it doesn't know how to hunt, it doesn't know how to do anything. So the parents have left it, and they've both gone out to find a rat or a snake for it, I don't know what, and he's sitting there, and he doesn't know. You can see the bird, I see him 200 meters away, and he is clueless. He doesn't know what to do with his time. He is hanging around there, he's calling around, and he's just basically walking around on the ground. And then I look at him, and he's got this very quizzical expression on his face. He's looking at a big monitor lizard, and he's never seen anything like it. He doesn't know what to do, because mommy and daddy aren't there to explain what to do when you see a big monitor, monitor lizard. So he's looking at it, and the monitor lizard disappears, and meanwhile, I'm creeping up on him, and I get to, from about 100 meters away, I get to within about 15 meters, and then I start shooting. There's no point in shooting before that, it's too far. The light is miserable. It's June. Yeah? So it's really cloudy. I bump up the eye, so as high as my camera can handle it, to about 1600 or so. I get to within 15 meters, and then I'm, I'm already down on my knees, and I'm creeping up on him, and somehow he doesn't seem to be bothered. But he suddenly gets really excited because he sees his, his, his mother flying and she comes, mother or father, I'm not sure, she comes and lands straight up on a tree. And then I, I point the camera at her and she's got this expression because she's so embarrassed. She's just thinking, what is this idiot doing? There's a human being stalking him with a big metal weapon pointing at him. Five meters away, this guy is going to be the death of our family. She's got that expression. I swear to you, I mean, that's what I felt. Yeah? So, anyway, so the thing is, uh, he's not bothered. He, he can't understand. He's a complete imbecile because he can't understand why the mother won't come down and join him in the party. So he's sitting there, and then he does something that's like, you know, just when things can't get better, they do, because he's 10 meters away, and he jumps up and he sits on that stump. And he, like, he gives me a whole bunch of poses. He's, he's looking left, he's looking right, he's, He's, he's turning his head, he's got his crest up, he's calling, the works, and five minutes later he flies off. And I never get him that close again. And that's the thing about uh, photographing a bird. The scariest thing is you think, what if my car crashed? My camera car crashed. What if I wasn't there? If you miss that one day, you don't know when you're going to get it again next. It just doesn't happen. I mean, I, it could happen in theory. I could go and sit there all the time. But this photograph is a year and a half old, and I've never ever seen it that close. I saw it a few days ago again, but I never see it that close again. The other one that also took a lot of planning was this Oriental Dwarf Kingfisher. It's a yeah, it's a very beautiful bird. It's tiny. You won't believe the the common kingfisher that you see, or well, the first kingfisher I showed you was about that big. This isn't sea or somewhere, there's a swamp, and I mean, there's a small little river going through, uh, uh, through a forest, and no one's there, and it's, it's, it's just like, uh, it's quite difficult getting there, because you've got to carry all your gear and go there, and, and the light is miserable, because again, you've got trees all around you, and this, um, but I know that in the monsoon, that's, this bird is usually around that place, I've uh, been shorter, and it was a challenge for me, not just to photograph it, but to find it, because the thing is so tiny, you don't know whether it's there. Sometimes you see a flash of red and you don't know whether it's a bee or whether it was a kingfisher. So five times, five times, each time I spend an hour and a half and I get nothing. The second time I get a few shots, I can't use them. The fifth time I go there, I, I, I know where he's sitting now. Okay, I've narrowed it down to where he's going to sit. So I sit there about six, seven meters away and before I can assemble my equipment, he's sitting there. By the time I assemble it, he's gone. I sit there for about two and a half hours, and 
I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to give it three hours. And I think, yeah, about two hours and 45 minutes later, he comes flying up, sits right there. He does a couple of dives, and he's cleaning himself, and I don't know what, and he's gone. I went there this year again. Uh, I went there this year again, hoping to repeat, get some interesting shots. Just won't cooperate. He's not getting any way close to me this time. So again, another one of the shots that, you know, you just have, it was just that one day. And then you've got birds that are all around the place. This is the book cover. Yeah? So that's a crimson sunbird shot in my own garden. So my mom's quite proud of that because that's one of her plants. So she's just like, see, my plant got the, got the bird. Yeah? So, and in the season time, everyone wants to see a crimson sunbird. All my clients are like, they want to see Indian guitars, they want to see crimson sunbirds. And they're just not there. This is one of the birds that's more prominent, more um, easily found in in the um, in the off season uh, during the monsoon. So I I was just about to go out one day, and this bird is flying around. We've got a small little bird bath. He's he's flitting around from the bird bath to the front. Meanwhile, I'm dashing around in, in the house like the way the dogs usually do. And uh, I get to the front, and it's there. It doesn't seem to be bothered. It's calling away. And uh, it was, again, it wasn't really great light, but somehow I managed to lock focus on it. And uh, I was pleased with the picture, and then eventually we decided to make it the, the cover. Yeah. And, oops, okay. So another, uh, another couple. Uh, so this is I want to show you this one because this is the state bird of Goa. It's a ruby-throated bulbul. We're chasing it for a year, and I was talking about the, the bird that I uh, the birds that I photographed with my friend's bird bar down in Palolem. Yeah, they've got a bird bar out there, and this is one of the birds that comes as, as a pair of them. And uh, it's a straight bird, and I would never get it that close. So I find bird bars very interesting. You can sometimes trick, uh, you know, uh, get a photograph where you don't even have the bird bar. You put a stick there, so so the bird will come and sit on that. And uh, you can get a bird really close that you will not, never usually see down that low. Sorry, am I closing the wrong thing? Okay, we need to get. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm going to run through the pictures really quickly now. So, so, another really interesting bird for me was this Malabar Chopa. It's a beautiful bird. It's a bird of the Western Ghats. Uh, you're only going to get it if you go all the way to Borla or, uh, or to Malabar National Park. Another bird that took me at least five tries. Drive there to Borla, don't get anything, come back. Don't be bothered, say you had a great day, go back again, and then one day it's just there. So these are all really, really uh, uh, valuable birds for birders. They're dying to see them, and if you just give it time, if you just go there often enough, you learn things about the bird, you figure out what it wants to do. So if you get, say for instance, a fruiting tree, yeah, then you get a bird like this, a compass with barbet. Yeah? It's, it's usually, again, it's difficult to get them down. I was sitting um, on the... Uh, on the first floor of someone's house, and they had a fruiting tree right at the same level, a fig tree. Bird comes in there, a bird that you hear all the time, you never see. Okay? Really beautiful bird, get it close enough, you get a really interesting shot. So, I think that should be enough. Yeah, yeah I'm going to close. So, yeah, those are some of my, uh, my experiences with shooting birds in Goa. It was a really interesting challenge. and. Uh, I hope you enjoy this little presentation and thank you for the thank you. So this is a book, it's a really beautiful real book. Unfortunately it isn't available at this big fest because we are waiting on the chief minister to do a formal release and since the forest department is involved we'll have to go through that process. But it should be available very soon, right? Hopefully. Uh, but if yeah, if anyone's interested in the book, you can talk to Rahul and get uh, an email ID and a phone number where you can order the book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much.